Chapter Nineteen of Riders of the Purple Sage. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Laurie Ann Walden. Riders of the Purple Sage by Zane Grey. Chapter Nineteen. Fay. At the home of Jane Witherstein, little Fay was climbing Lassiter's knee. "'Does oo love me?' she asked. Lassiter, who was as serious with Fay as he was gentle and loving, assured her in earnest and elaborate speech that he was her devoted subject. Fay looked thoughtful, and appeared to be debating the duplicity of men, or searching for a supreme test to prove this cavalier. "'Does oo love my new mother?' she asked, with bewildering suddenness. Jane Witherstein laughed, and for the first time in many a day she felt a stir of her pulse and warmth in her cheek. It was a still, drowsy summer of afternoon, and the three were sitting in the shade of the wooded knoll that faced the sage slope. Little Fay's brief spell of unhappy longing for her mother, the childish mystic gloom, had passed, and now where Fay was there were prattle and laughter and glee. She had emerged from sorrow to be the incarnation of joy and loveliness. She had grown supernaturally sweet and beautiful. For Jane Witherstein the child was an answer to prayer, a blessing, a possession infinitely more precious than all she had lost. For Lassiter, Jane divined that little Fay had become a religion. "'Does you love my new mother?' repeated Fay. Lassiter's answer to this was a modest and sincere affirmative. "'Why don't you marry my new mother and be my father?' Of the thousands of questions put by little Fay to Lassiter, this was the first he had been unable to answer. "'Fay, Fay, don't ask questions like that,' said Jane. "'Why?' "'Because,' replied Jane, and she found it strangely embarrassing to meet the child's gaze. It seemed to her that Fay's violet eyes looked through her with piercing wisdom. "'You love him, don't you?' "'Dear child, run and play.' said Jane. But don't go too far. Don't go from this little hill. Fay pranced off wildly, joyous over freedom that had not been granted her for weeks. Jane, why are children more sincere than grown-up persons? asked Lassiter. Are they? I reckon so. Little Fay there, she sees things as they appear on the face. An Indian does that. So does a dog and an Indian and a dog are most of the time right in what they see. Maybe a child is always right. "'Well, what does Fay see?' asked Jane. "'I reckon you know. I wonder what goes on in Fay's mind, when she sees part of the truth with the wise eyes of a child, and wanting to know more, meets with strange falseness from you. Wait. You are false in a way, though you're the best woman I ever knew. What I want to say is this.' Fay has taken your pretending to, to care for me for the thing it looks on the face, and her little form and mind asks questions, and the answers she gets are different from the looks of things. So she'll grow up gradually taking on that falseness, and be like the rest of the women, and men too. And the truth of this falseness to life is proved by your appearing to love me when you don't. Things aren't what they seem. Lassiter, you're right. A child should be told the absolute truth. But is that possible? I haven't been able to do it, and all my life I've loved the truth, and I've prided myself upon being truthful. Maybe that was only egotism. I'm learning much, my friend. Some of those blinding scales have fallen from my eyes. And, as to caring for you, I think I care a great deal. How much, how little, I couldn't say. My heart is almost broken, Lassiter. So now is not a good time to judge of affection." I can still play and be merry with Fay. I can still dream. But when I attempt serious thought, I'm dazed. I don't think. I don't care any more. I don't pray. Think of that, my friend. But in spite of my numb feeling, I believe I'll rise out of all this dark agony a better woman, with greater love of man and God. I'm on the rack now. I'm senseless to all but pain, and growing dead to that. Sooner or later I shall rise out of this stupor. I'm waiting the hour." "'It'll soon come, Jane,' replied Lassiter soberly. "'Then I'm afraid for you. Years are terrible things, and for years you've been bound. 
habit of years is strong as life itself. Somehow, though, I believe as you that you'll come out of it all a finer woman. I'm waitin' too, and I'm wonderin' I reckon, Jane, that marriage between us is out of all human reason. Lassiter, my dear friend, it's impossible for us to marry. Why, as Fay says, inquired Lassiter with gentle persistence. Why? I never thought why. But it's not possible. I am Jane, daughter of Witherstein. My father would rise out of his grave. I'm of Mormon birth. I'm being broken, but I'm still a Mormon woman. And you, you are Lassiter. Maybe I'm not so much Lassiter as I used to be. What was it you said? Habit of years is strong as life itself? You can't change the one habit, the purpose of your life. For you still pack those black guns. You still nurse your passion for blood. A smile, like a shadow, flickered across his face. No. Lassiter, I lied to you, but I beg of you, don't you lie to me. I've great respect for you. I believe you're softened toward most, perhaps all my people except— But when I speak of your purpose, your hate, your guns, I have only him in mind. I don't believe you've changed. For answer he unbuckled the heavy cartridge belt, and laid it with the heavy swing gun sheaths in her lap. Lassiter, Jane whispered, as she gazed from him to the black, cold guns. Without them he appeared shorn of strength, defenseless, a smaller man. Was she Delilah? Swiftly, conscious of only one motive, refusal to see this man called craven by his enemies, she rose, and with blundering fingers buckled the belt round his waist where it belonged. Lassiter, I am a coward. "'Come with me out of Utah, where I can put away my guns and be a man,' he said. "'I reckon I'll prove it to you then. "'Come. You've got Black Star back, and Knight and Bells. "'Let's take the racers and Little Fay and race out of Utah. "'The horses and the child are all you have left. Come.' "'No, no, Lassiter. I'll never leave Utah. "'What would I do in the world with my broken fortunes and my broken heart?' I'll never leave these purple slopes I love so well. I reckon I ought to have knowed that. Presently you'll be living down here in a hovel, and presently Jane Witherstein will be a memory. I only wanted to have a chance to show you how a man, any man, can be better than he was. If we left Utah, I could prove, I reckon I could prove this thing you call love. It's strange, and hell and heaven at once, Jane Witherstein. Appears to me that you've thrown away your big heart on love. Love of religion, and duty, and churchmen, and riders, and poor families, and poor children. Yet you can't see what love is, how it changes a person. Listen, and in telling you Millie Earn's story, I'll show you how love changed her. Millie and me was children when our family moved from Missouri to Texas, and we growed up in Texas ways, same as if we'd been born there. We had been poor, and there we prospered. In time, the little village where we went became a town— and strangers and new families kept moving in. Millie was the belle them days. I can see her now, a little girl no bigger than a bird, and as pretty. She had the finest eyes, dark blue-black when she was excited, and beautiful all the time. You remember Millie's eyes. And she had light brown hair with streaks of gold, and a mouth that every feller wanted to kiss. And about the time Millie was the prettiest and the sweetest, along came a young minister who began to ride some of a race with the other fellers for Millie, and he won. Millie had always been strong on religion, and when she met Frank Earn, she went in heart and soul for the salvation of souls. Fact was, Millie, through study of the Bible and attending church and revivals, went a little out of her head. It didn't worry the old folks none, and the only worry to me was Millie's everlasting praying and working to save my soul. She never converted me, but we was the best of comrades, and I reckon no brother and sister ever loved each other better. Well, Frank Earn and me hit up a great friendship. He was a strappin' feller, good to look at, and had the most pleasin' ways. His religion never bothered me, for he could hunt and fish and ride and be a good feller. After Buffalo once, he came pretty near to saving my life. We got to be thick as brothers, and he was the only man I ever seen who I thought was good enough for Millie. And the day they were married, I got drunk for the only time in my life. Soon after that, I left home. It seems Millie was the only one who could keep me home, and I went to the bad, 
As to prosperin', I saw some pretty hard life in the panhandle, and then I went north. In them days, Kansas and Nebraska was as bad, come to think of it, as these days right here on the border of Utah. I got to be pretty handy with guns, and there wasn't many riders as could beat me ridin'. And I can say all modest-like that I never seen the white man who could track a hoss or a steer or a man with me. Afore I knowed it, two years slipped by, and all at once I got homesick, and purled a bridle south. Things at home had changed. I never got over that homecoming. Mother was dead and in her grave. Father was a silent, broken man, killed already on his feet. Frank Earn was a ghost of his old self, through with workin', through with preachin', almost through with livin', and Milly was gone. It was a long time before I got the story. Father had no mind left, and Frank Earn was afraid to talk. So I had to pick up what had happened from different people. It appears that soon after I left home another preacher come to the little town, and he and Frank become rivals. This feller was different from Frank. He preached some other kind of religion, and he was quick and passionate, where Frank was slow and mild. He went after people, women specially. In looks he couldn't compare to Frank Earn, but he had power over women. He had a voice, and he talked and talked, and preached and preached. Milly fell under his influence. She became mightily interested in his religion. Frank had patience with her, as was his way, and let her be as interested as she liked. All religions were devoted to one God, he said, and it wouldn't hurt Milly none to study a different point of view. So the new preacher often called on Milly, and sometimes in Frank's absence. Frank was a cattleman between Sundays. Along about this time an incident come off that I couldn't get much light on. A stranger come to town, and was seen with the preacher. This stranger was a big man with an eye like blue ice and a beard of gold. He had money, and he peered a man of mystery, and the town went to buzzin when he disappeared about the same time as a young woman known to be mightily interested in the new preacher's religion. Then presently along comes a man from somewheres in Illinois, and he up and spots this preacher as a famous Mormon proselyter. That riled Frank Earn as nothin' ever before, and from rivals they come to be bitter enemies. And it ended in Frank goin' to the meetin' house where Milly was listenin', and before her and everybody else he called that preacher called him, well, almost as hard as Venters called Tull here some time back. And Frank followed up that call with a hoss whippin', and he drove the proselyter out of town. People noticed, so twas said, that Milly's sweet disposition changed. Some said it was because she would soon become a mother, and others said she was pinin' after the new religion. And there was women who said right out that she was pinin' after the Mormon. Anyway, one morning Frank rode in from one of his trips to find Milly gone. He had no real near neighbors, livin' a little out of town, but those who was nearest said a wagon had gone by in the night, and they thought it stopped at her door. Well, tracks always tell, and there was the wagon tracks, and hoss tracks, and man tracks. The news spread like wildfire that Milly had run off from her husband. Everybody but Frank believed it, and wasn't slow in tellin' why she run off. Mother had always hated that strange streak of Milly's, taken up with the new religion as she had, and she believed Milly ran off with the Mormon. That hastened Mother's death, and she died unforgiven. Father wasn't the kind to bow down under disgrace or misfortune, but he had surpassing love for Milly, and the loss of her broke him. From the minute I heard of Milly's disappearance, I never believed she went off of her own free will. I knew Milly, and I knew she couldn't have done that. I stayed at home a while, trying to make Frank Earn talk, but if he knowed anything, then he wouldn't tell it. So I set out to find Milly, and I tried to get on the trail of that proselyter. I knew if I ever struck a town he'd visited that I'd get a trail. I knew, too, that nothing short of hell would stop his proselyting. And I rode from town to town. I had a blind faith that something was guiding me. And as the weeks and months went by, I growed into a strange sort of a man, I guess. Anyway, people were afraid of me. Two years after that, way over in a corner of Texas, I struck a town where my man had been. He'd just left. People said he came to that town without a woman. I back-trailed my man through Arkansas and Mississippi, and the old trail got hot again in Texas. I found the town where he first went after leaving home. And here I got track of Milly. I found a cabin where she had given birth to her baby. There was no way to tell whether she'd been kept a prisoner or not. 
The feller who owned the place was a mean, silent sort of a skunk, and as I was leaving, I just took a chance and left my mark on him. Then I went home again. It was to find I hadn't any home no more. Father had been dead a year. Frank Earn still lived in the house where Milly had left him. I stayed with him a while, and I grew old watching him. His farm had gone to weed. His cattle had strayed or been rustled. His house weathered till it wouldn't keep out rain nor wind. And Frank sat on the porch and whittled sticks, and day by day wasted away. There was times when he ranted about like a crazy man. But mostly he was always sitting and staring with eyes that made a man curse. I figured Frank had a secret fear that I needed to know. And when I told him I'd trailed Milly for near three years, and had got trace of her, and saw where she'd had her baby, I thought he would drop dead at my feet. And when he'd come round more natural-like, he begged me to give up the trail, but he wouldn't explain. So I let him alone, and watched him day and night. And I found there was one thing still precious to him, and it was a little drawer where he kept his papers. This was in the room where he slept, and it appeared he seldom slept. But after being patient, I got the contents of that drawer and found two letters from Milly. One was a long letter written a few months after her disappearance. She had been bound and gagged and dragged away from her home by three men, and she named them Hurd, Metzger, Slack. They were strangers to her. She was taken to the little town where I found trace of her two years after. But she didn't send the letter from that town. There she was pinned in. Appeared that the proselytes, who had, of course, come on the scene, was not running any risks of losing her. She went on to say that for a time she was out of her head, and when she got right again, all that kept her alive was the baby. It was a beautiful baby, she said, and all she thought and dreamed of was somehow to get baby back to its father, and then she'd thankfully lay down and die. And the letter ended abrupt, in the middle of a sentence, and it wasn't signed. The second letter was written more than two years after the first. It was from Salt Lake City. It simply said that Milly had heard her brother was on her trail. She asked Frank to tell her brother to give up the search, because if he didn't, she would suffer in a way too horrible to tell. She didn't beg. She just stated a fact and made the simple request. And she ended that letter by saying she would soon leave Salt Lake City with the man she had come to love, and would never be heard of again. I recognized Milly's handwriting, and I recognized her way of putting things. But that second letter told me of some great change in her. Pondering over it, I felt at last she'd either come to love that feller and his religion, or some terrible fear made her lie and say so. I couldn't be sure which. But of course I meant to find out. I'll say here, if I'd known Mormons then as I do now, I'd left Milly to her fate. For maybe she was right about what she'd suffer if I kept on her trail. But I was young and wild them days. First I went to the town where she'd first been taken, and I went to the place where she'd been kept. I got that skunk who owned the place, and took him out in the woods, and made him tell all he knowed. There wasn't much as to length, but it was pure hell's fire in substance. This time I left him some incapacitated for any more skunk work short of hell. Then I hit the trail for Utah. That was fourteen years ago. I saw the incoming of most of the Mormons. It was a wild country, and a wild time. I rode from town to town, village to village, ranch to ranch, camp to camp. I never stayed long in one place. I never had but one idea. I never rested. Four years went by, and I knowed every trail in northern Utah. I kept on, and as time went by, and I'd begun to grow old in my search, I had firmer, blinder faith in whatever was guiding me. Once I read about a feller who sailed the seven seas and traveled the world, and he had a story to tell, and whenever he seen the man to whom he must tell that story, he knowed him on sight. I was like that, only I had a question to ask. And always I knew the man of whom I must ask. So I never really lost the trail, though for many years it was the dimmest trail ever followed by any man. Then come a change in my luck. Along in central Utah I rounded up herd, and I whispered something in his ear, and watched his face, and then throwed a gun against his bowels. And he died with his teeth so tight shut I couldn't have pried them open with a knife. Slack and Metzger that same year both heard me whisper the same question, and neither would they speak a word when they lay dying. Long before I'd learned no man of this breed or class, or God knows what, would give up any secrets. 
I had to see in a man's fear of death the connections with Milly Erne's fate. And as the years passed, at long intervals, I would find such a man. So, as I drifted on the long trail down into southern Utah, my name preceded me, and I had to meet a people prepared for me and ready with guns. They made me a gunman, and that suited me. And all this time signs of the proselyter and the giant with the blue ice eyes and the gold beard seemed to fade dimmer out of the trail. Only twice in ten years did I find a trace of that mysterious man who had visited the proselyter at my home village. What he had to do with Milly's fate was beyond all hope for me to learn, unless my guiding spirit led me to him. As for the other man, I knew, as sure as I breathed and the stars shone and the wind blew, that I'd meet him some day. Eighteen years I've been on the trail, and it led me to the last lonely villages of the Utah border. Eighteen years! I feel pretty old now. I was only twenty when I hit that trail. Well, as I told you, back here a ways, a Gentile said Jane Witherstein could tell me about Milly Earn and show me her grave. The low voice ceased, and Lassiter slowly turned his sombrero round and round, and appeared to be counting the silver ornaments on the band. Jane, leaning toward him, sat as if petrified, listening intently, waiting to hear more. She could have shrieked, but power of tongue and lips were denied her. She saw only this sad, gray, passion-worn man, and she heard only the faint rustling of the leaves. "'Well, I came to Cottonwoods,' went on Lassiter, "'and you showed me Milly's grave. And though your teeth have been shut, tighter than them of all the dead men lying back along that trail, just the same you told me the secret I've lived these eighteen years to hear. Jane, I said you'd tell me without ever me asking. I didn't need to ask my question here.' The day you remember when that fat party throwed a gun on me in your court, and— Oh, hush! whispered Jane, blindly holding up her hands. I seen in your face that Dyer, now a bishop, was the proselyter who ruined Milly Erne. For an instant Jane Witherstein's brain was a whirling chaos, and she recovered to find herself grasping at Lassiter like one drowning. And as if by a lightning stroke she sprang from her dull apathy into exquisite torture— "'It's a lie, Lassiter. No, no,' she moaned. "'I swear you're wrong.' "'Stop. You'd perjure yourself. But I'll spare you that. You poor woman. Still blind, still faithful. Listen, I know. Let that settle it. And I give up my purpose.' "'What is it you say?' "'I give up my purpose. I've come to see and feel differently. I can't help poor Milly.' and I've outgrowed revenge. I've come to see I can be no judge for men. I can't kill a man just for hate. Hate ain't the same with me since I loved you and little Fay. Lassiter, you mean you won't kill him? Jane whispered. No. For my sake? I reckon. I can't understand, but I'll respect your feelings. Because you— Oh, because you love me? Eighteen years! You were that terrible Lassiter. And now, because you love me? That's it, Jane. Oh, you'll make me love you. How can I help but love you? My heart must be stone. But, oh, Lassiter, wait, wait. Give me time. I'm not what I was. Once it was so easy to love, now it's easy to hate. Wait. My faith in God, some God, still lives. By it I see happier times for you, poor passion-swayed wanderer. For me, a miserable, broken woman. I loved your sister, Milly. I will love you. I can't have fallen so low, I can't be so abandoned by God, that I've no love left to give you. Wait. Let us forget Milly's sad life. Ah, I knew it as no one else on earth. There's one thing I shall tell you, if you're at my deathbed, but I can't speak now. "'I reckon I don't want to hear no more,' said Lassiter. Jane leaned against him, as if some pent-up force had rent its way out. She fell into a paroxysm of weeping. Lassiter held her in silent sympathy. By degrees she regained composure, and she was rising, sensible of being relieved of a weighty burden, when a sudden start on Lassiter's part alarmed her. "'I heard hosses, hosses with muffled hoofs,' he said, and he got up guardedly. "'Where's Fay? 
asked Jane, hurriedly glancing round the shady knoll. The bright-haired child, who had appeared to be close all the time, was not in sight. Fay called Jane. No answering shout of glee, no patter of flying feet. Jane saw Lassiter stiffen. Fay, Oh, Fay! Jane almost screamed. The leaves quivered and rustled. A lonesome cricket chirped in the grass. A bee hummed by. The silence of the waning afternoon breathed hateful portent. It terrified Jane. When had silence been so infernal? "'She's only straight out of earshot,' faltered Jane, looking at Lassiter. Pale, rigid as a statue, the rider stood, not in listening, searching posture, but in one of doomed certainty. Suddenly he grasped Jane with an iron hand, and turning his face from her gaze, he strode with her from the knoll. "'See, Fay played here last, a house of stones and sticks, and here's a corral of pebbles with leaves for horses,' said Lassiter stridently, and pointed to the ground. Back and forth she trailed here. See, she's buried something, a dead grasshopper. There's a tombstone. Here she went, chasing a lizard. See the tiny streaked trail? She pulled bark off this cottonwood. Look in the dust of the path, the letters you taught her. She's drawn pictures of birds and horses and people. Look, a cross. Oh, Jane, your cross. Lassiter dragged Jane on, and as if from a book read the meaning of little Fay's trail. All the way down the knoll, through the shrubbery, round and round a cottonwood, Fay's vagrant fancy left records of her sweet musings and innocent play. Long had she lingered round a bird-nest to leave therein the gaudy wing of a butterfly. Long had she played beside the running stream, sending adrift vessels freighted with pebbly cargo. Then she had wandered through the deep grass, her tiny feet scarcely turning a fragile blade, and she had dreamed beside some old faded flowers. Thus her steps led her into the broad lane. The little dimpled imprints of her bare feet showed clean-cut in the dust. They went a little way down the lane, and then, at a point where they stopped, the great tracks of a man led out from the shrubbery and returned. End of chapter 19